peace to you all from our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. And welcome to First Presbyterian Church. It is such a joy to see you all here this morning. Um, and uh, a wonderful time for us to, to praise God here at God's Open Place. As we come together, I have a few announcements that I want to share with everybody. The first uh, is that immediately after worship, we're having our first Thomas talk. That is, we've been collecting questions from uh, anybody and everybody about faith that they'd love to discuss in our faith community. Uh, we've been putting them in a box in the narthex. I'm going to leave that box out in case people continue to have questions that they'd like to, to share. And downstairs, uh, right after church, we will sit and we'll talk about it and we'll enjoy the wisdom in the room and hopefully learn and grow together as we explore the things that challenge us where our doubts are, just like Thomas had. Uh, also, immediately after worship, we have something uh, else going on, and Jim Grenier is going to come talk to us about it.
on a couple of Sundays in June, right after church. Uh, we, we will share a meal together, we'll talk about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a Presbyterian, and what it means to be a part of Pippin Presbyterian Church, our history, and, and who we are as people and how you can get involved. So we encourage anybody who's interested to join us for that. Are there other announcements that we have as we begin, Beth? For those of you who like to recycle your bulletin or any other papers that we have here, um, there is a black recycling bin underneath the quilt, right out in the hallway here. New recycling bin. Jason. I uh, just want to let everybody know if you know anyone who's planning to apply for the Cole Lacey Scholarship, the deadline is next Monday. The applications and materials need to be in the office by next Monday. You can find information on our website under the Youth tab. If you're interested or, or uh, somebody you know is interested in applying for the Cole Lacey Scholarship, the deadline is next Monday, so please get the materials in by then. We're pretty rigid about that deadline, and you can find the materials on our website under the youth tab. It's a scholarship of, sorry? Yes. As far as the new members, I believe the other one is the 23rd. Is it the 23rd and the 9th? 23rd and the 15th? I thought it was 23rd. Two Sundays in June. Are there other announcements that we have this week? Then let us prepare our hearts for worship by listening to the prayer.
because to forget them is to repeat them. But we do not forget God's love for us, which overcomes our sinfulness. In confessing our sins, we choose to remember both our own lack of faith and the one whose mercy overcomes our faithlessness. Only with both firmly in mind can we stand firm in faith going forward. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, afraid to act, and uncertain in our actions. We are unwilling to commit to anything but our guarantees, and we put our trust in the empty promises of the world. Forgive us, Lord. When you were dead in trespasses, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with his legal demands, he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Peace of Christ be with you all. Uh, so the bulletin's missing something. Did anybody catch it? Yeah. This was a test. <laughs> we are singing a new glory this week. It's, it's number 584 in your hymnal.
And I said, I don't believe in meteors. I'm going to go wait in the car. Where it's not itchy or cold and there are no bugs. Do you think, how do you think I felt when everybody saw meteors? Bored, sad, yeah. Does anybody know what jealous means? It's when you want to have something that somebody else has, but you don't get to have it. Yeah, I was bored and sad and jealous. Do you think I really didn't believe in meteors? I think I did believe in meteors. I was just mad because I didn't get to see one and everybody else did. So today is a day that we talk about a very special story of the Bible to me. It's the story of a person named Thomas. You guys remember that Jesus died and then Jesus came back and he was alive again. The reason that we know he was alive again is that he appeared to his disciples that very night. He went to see his disciples uh, and uh, he said to them, peace be with you. And they were amazed that he was alive and they were rejoicing. But Thomas had been out. I like to think that he was getting groceries for everybody else. Uh, and when he got back, they said, Jesus is here. And he said, where? And they said, oh, you missed him. <laughs> and Thomas said, I don't believe that Jesus came back unless I get to see it for real. And the next week, Jesus did come back. And he came back at a time that Thomas was there. And when Thomas saw Jesus, Jesus said, Hey, I heard that you wouldn't believe until you saw me, but here I am. And you can't, you can not only see me, but you can touch me. Because I am back and I am real. And Thomas said, Ah, oh, my Lord and my God. That is, he said, I believe that you are back. Sometimes we feel sad when we miss out on something that everybody else got to see. And sometimes it feels like we missed out on something that everybody else got to see in Jesus. Maybe they got to have some special experience that we didn't have, or, or maybe they, they just know something that we didn't know. And we say, I don't think that I can believe in that. But what the story of Thomas tells us uh, is that what happened with Jesus was real, and we can trust that Jesus, even in our doubts, and even in our disbelief, even when we're feeling sad or angry or bored or jealous, even through all of that, Jesus can come to us and we can see and know that he is God. Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for showing up for Thomas. And for showing up for us. Help us to trust you in everything we do. Amen. It is time for you to repent. Rather than any human authority. 
the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they had heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him too. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So, in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. They were convinced by him, and when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. As they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name of Jesus. Before I read our passage for this Sunday, I'm going to make an observation about translation, which I'm sure you guys are already doing. Um, this passage is translated in, or uh, part of this passage is translated in the NRSV as the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. I find this to be a profoundly silly translation uh, because the people on the inside of those doors were Jews and the people on the outside of those doors were Jews as well. Uh, the, the Greek there is eudaioi, uh, which is uh, translated alternately Judeans, as in people of the province of Judea, or Jews, as in everybody in the province of Judea was Jewish. Sort of by definition, it was the national religion. If you weren't Jewish, you were from somewhere else. You had a different nationality or ethnicity. Um, and it reflects a degree of antipathy between the authors of the Gospels and the Jewish community at the time. In the wake of the destruction of the temple, there were two major movements that were trying to sort of redefine what it meant to be the people of God in the world. One was a group of people that were committed to uh, a focus on Torah and righteousness and rededicating themselves to God and God alone. Another group was a body of people who believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and those people were in conflict. And that conflict was clearly very evident for John and John's community. And um, because of that, uh, historically, people have interpreted uh, Jews and Christians to be in conflict or in enmity. But that conflict is not really a conflict. It is not uh, a tradition that we should try to replicate. It's a tradition that we should try to understand. Uh, later, interpreters took the crucifixion narrative and they interpreted it to mean that Jesus, that Jews were enemies of Jesus when all of Jesus' friends were Jews. And it's been historically used to justify um, a deep and intense litany of violence. As we think about what it means to be a Christian in the 21st century and what we know about violence between Christians and Jews, that Christians were often the perpetrators of violence and Jews often the receivers of the violence, it is worth remembering what Paul said, that we are a branch engrafted onto a tree. The branch does not get to tell the roots of the tree what to do. And for the branch to attack the other branches or the roots of the tree is only to attack themselves. As we mourn yet another um, 
shooting in a synagogue, let us rededicate ourselves to the knowledge that we are guests in the house of Israel. We share in a tradition, we share in fellowship, and we share in friendship. And as we read these passages, remember that it is not Jews or Jewish people who are the enemies, but those who set themselves in opposition to Christ, and we are among them more often than not. Our reading comes from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 9, no, chapter 20, sorry, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand and his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Until I can put my finger in his hands and place my hand in his side. That's a rather gruesome thing to say. That's kind of a weird detail to hang on to. Just, just the notion that Thomas would use different parts of his hand to, to probe different wounds of Jesus. That's, that's an odd little detail to include in this story. It fits in parallel with another little detail found in Luke's Gospel in a story very similar to this one. While the disciples are rejoicing in stunned bewilderment that Christ has risen and Christ has appeared among them, Jesus says, you guys got anything to eat? He was hungry. And they found a piece of broiled fish, and they gave it to him, and he ate it. Both of these details are odd things to focus on, right? When there's something much bigger at stake. But both of them are in there for a reason. The Gospels are at pains to emphasize that the resurrection of Jesus was a bodily resurrection. It was tempting to say to, to the women uh, who had found the empty tomb to whom he had appeared, or to, to those at Emmaus who had met him walking along the way, that, oh, uh, sure, yeah, what you saw was Jesus, but it was a, a ghost of Jesus, or, or it was a spirit of Jesus, or, or it was a hallucination of Jesus, or, or a vision from God, or a dream, or, or something other than the physical, real presence of God. That was, that was what people were saying. That was a temptation that people had. Uh, but these two details, and, and many other besides, are, are the gospel writers attempt to make it perfectly painfully clear that when Jesus came, it was not as a ghost, it was not as a spirit, as a vision, as a hallucination, as anything else, but the real physical presence of Jesus Christ. He was hungry. 
he had wounds in his side. I, I hadn't really thought about that detail until last week when I was talking about how Jesus must have hurt on that morning. And even when we hurt, the victory is still assured, assured for us. But Jesus was resurrected with his wounds. God brought Jesus back to life, but didn't remove the wound from his side, didn't remove the wounds from his hands and his feet. What a strange thing to do. Hanging on to these deep details, Luke and John are trying to tell us that the resurrection was Jesus Christ in the flesh. He was dead, but now he was alive. And Jesus says in the book of Luke, touch me and see. Proclaiming this was so important that they hung on to these little details like exactly what fish he ate. It wasn't grilled. It wasn't fried or steamed. It was broiled fish. And they preserved things like this, this encounter between Thomas and Jesus, which is really kind of embarrassing for Thomas, if, if you want to think about it that way, but so crucial for us who need to know that the resurrection was a resurrection of the body. It mattered a lot to them. And it should matter a lot to us. Because the resurrection of Christ is the resurrection that we are hoping for for ourselves. When we are at a funeral and we lay a body in the ground, I always say these words from Paul, because we have been united with him in a death like his, surely we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. That is the resurrection that we're hoping for is the resurrection of Christ. It is not any other resurrection. So if we're expecting a resurrection, then we're expecting a bodily resurrection. And what that means for us is that bodies matter. Our bodies matter. Other people's bodies matter. And the things that we do with our bodies matter. And, and the way our bodies are and the way our bodies can be matters. Your body matters. Even when it is wounded. Even when it is gruesome, even when it is difficult and painful to, to, to use or enjoy or love, even when it's difficult, even when it doesn't do the things that you want it to do. So caring for our bodies becomes not just an act of, of self-discipline, but instead an act of faith. And caring for other people's bodies becomes not just a, a kindness that you might have for some other person, but instead a sacred commandment from our Lord for anybody who would hear the call of Jesus and want to follow him. What this means is that people who are, are differently abled are not broken because their bodies don't work the same way that other people's bodies do. Or people whose minds work differently from other people's minds are not wrong or different or, or objects of, of pity or, or narratives of, of overcoming or people in need of being fixed because their, their minds work differently. People who are, are blind or deaf or artistic are not tragedies in need of repair or, or opportunities for redemption, but instead they are whole and fully realized humans whose bodies are different from mine, but who contribute just like me to the great diverse body of Christ and whose salvation is bound up with mine. I cannot say in the words of Paul that I do not need them any more than the foot can say to the eye, I don't need you. Because the bodies that we were given are our bodies. And they were, however typically or, or untypically functioned, they are the bodies through which we are saved. They are the bodies that are ours in the resurrection. This is why Christians met in the catacombs. It wasn't just because they were hiding. They were, sure. But it was a convenient place because of the other work that they were doing. Christians, early Christians, cared for the bodies of people who had died. They paid for burials and, and care for bodies for poor people that had no one to care for them or bury them because bodies matter. They were living within the, the Jewish tradition that they valued bodies as well. Unlike the Greeks that saw the body as sort of a, 
a decrepit shell of a fallen nature that housed a perfect soul. For, for Jews and for Christians, there was no distinction between the body and the soul. Instead, there was a whole self. And it is perfect, not because it looks the same as every other body, not because it is able to do the same things as every other body, but because it is God's beloved child that makes it perfect. Now all of this talk about bodies and, and, and that bodies matter brings up a, a profound question, which is when we, when we think about the resurrection, if, if we believe in a body, bodily resurrection, what sort of bodies will we have in the resurrection? Will it be the body that you had at 18? The body that you had at 28? 48? 88? What, what will it be like? The assumption is that it comes from, from Revelation 21. We were told that uh, there will be no more crying or tears in that holy city, the new Jerusalem, right? And so we assume that there will be no sickness, there will be no illness, there will be no dis disability in the resurrection. But but Amos, Amos Young is a professor at, at Fuller Divinity School. I'm sorry if I'm a little bit off. I didn't do a lot of sleep last night. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he's a professor, uh, and he writes he has an interest in, in disability uh, and how we understand disability. One of the things he talks about is the healings of Christ are only partially about the physical. They're also about the social. When, when Jesus heals somebody, he removes those barriers that separate them from other people. He removes the stigma that separates them from other people. He removes the sort of social and psychological and church conditions that divide us from each other. And Amos has a, a different take on the resurrection from, from the one that I, I think I grew up with, which was that when we are resurrected, our bodies will be made perfect, and so they will be free of anything that is different from what we would want it to be or, or, or what other people's bodies would be. But Amos says, what if, what if it's not like that? What if we're not perfected into being all the same? What if we are perfect because we are different? What if our perfection is not made up of, of having a body that is, that is uh, just like the, the most capable body that, that there are on earth? What if our, our bodies are made perfect by removing not the difference in ability, but in all of the things that make the difference in ability hard for us to be one body with each other? So he says, uh, we can imagine that deaf people say, when we get to heaven, the signing is going to be tremendous. We can imagine that, that when we are resurrected, they're, they're, that we might still have the same bodies that we died in. That we might look like Jesus. That we might still have our wounds. Now, if, if, you, if you think about this for a second, it, it could get disturbing, right? Does, does, does that mean that the resurrection, uh, we're all going to sort of look like zombies? Is, is heaven going to look like the walking dead? And, and what Young is suggesting is, is that maybe what is going to be removed from us is not the wounds, but that in us which is disgusted by the woundedness of other people. That inability to be one body with somebody who is different for us. That inability to see other people the way Christ sees us as beautiful children of God who are perfect. He suggests a resurrection that is not the same in perfection, but perfect in differentness. Our resurrected bodies, he suggests, will be like Jesus' resurrection, resurrected bodies, bearing the marks of life, not unrecognizable from the bodies that we live our lives in. Instead of a, a collection of perfected people in typical bodies, it will be a collection of perfected people in their own bodies. 
uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman is uh, a minister. She's the executive minister, the executive minister of justice and witness ministries for the United Church of Christ, the UCC. She's one of the most profound voices in Christianity today, and I encourage you to seek her out and, and find her and read what she has to write, because uh, she is truly a profound and important voice. And she tells this story uh, of when she was in Birmingham, she was working in a nurse. It was 1985. She was the new evening charge nurse at South Highland Hospital. She'd been off for a couple of days, and she got back on in service. Uh, and when she went on service, she was told that they had an AIDS patient on the floor. It was 1985. Health professionals did not know about AIDS, what they knew now. What they know now. It was early in the crisis, and people were afraid, and she was afraid. She was informed that he was belligerent, that he'd been spitting at nurses, that people had been, uh, uh, that he'd been disowned by his family because he was mean to them. And uh, Tracy was afraid, but she had always gone into every room and introduced herself to the patient to explain that she was the nurse and she was going to be taking care of them that evening. And so when she got into Jane's room, she said the spirit told her not to put on her gloves. And she walked in, and she sat down next to him, and she placed her hand on his arm, and she said, Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm going to be your nurse for this evening. And, and she saw tears start flowing in his face. And she said, are, are you hurting? Is, is something wrong? Was he in pain? No. This was the first time since he'd been admitted to the hospital that somebody had touched him, skin to skin. The near human touch caused him to be. That night, she cleaned his room. There had been trays of food stacked up all around the room because nobody would come and get them. She called cleaning, but they wouldn't come, and so she took care of him. She bathed his body. She changed his capital. When she was taking care of his body, he told his story. His closest friends were dead or dying of AIDS. His family, when they had heard that his diagnosis had disowned him, she stayed close to him that evening. She charted in his room that night so that he wouldn't be alone. He died the following day. His name was James Bell. She says, there's a wounding that happens in isolation that only love can heal. The resurrection of the body means that bodies matter. It means that the way that we care for our own bodies the way that we care for each other's bodies matter. It means that who we are now is, is who we will be, and who we are now is beloved. We're not going to be perfected into someone else. We will find perfection in removing that isolation that only love can heal. Siblings in Christ, treat your body imperfect as it is, as if it were a holy body. Because it is. However scarred and wounded it might be, however different your body or your mind might be from somebody else's body or somebody else's mind, it is yours and it is a holy thing. Treat other people's bodies as if they are holy bodies because they are. However different and unfamiliar to you they may be, however wounded and scarred and afraid they may be, because bodies matter. Because when Christ came back, he was wounded. But when Christ came back, he was perfect. And someday, if we can do this, we might be like Thomas who looked at a body that was broken and bruised, wounded and hurt, and said, my Lord and my God. Every body that we encounter, however different from the way it is, every person that we encounter, 
is the body of Christ. It is perfected when we can be perfect with it. When we can see the way Jesus sees, the way Thomas came to see, that we are all beloved, and that we are all one, and that we are all perfect. Not because we are the same, but because we are different and we are perfected together as one body in Christ. Resurrected and living eternal life together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
If you commit to one month, it doesn't mean you have to do it every month. We can have a rotating schedule where somebody decides to, you know, share the job with someone else. Um, um, I will be downstairs after the meeting, I mean, after the church uh, service. I know there's a lot of things going on between the mulching and um, the tech, the uh, Thomas talks, but I will be down there. Anybody who is interested in signing up for any of these jobs, we welcome you, and we hope that you will be part of the program, and we also hope that anyone here in church who would like to come out and just join us for a meal, please know that you are welcome. If you have a neighbor who's alone and perhaps would enjoy a meal um, prepared and some fellowship that goes with it, please extend invitations to them. We're going to start out fairly small to find out what our numbers are going to be, and then as, as we grow, we will do more advertising on social media and things like that, just to kind of um, get our get our <coughs> excuse me get our feet off the ground. So, if you have any questions about it, and if you um, want to be part of this wonderful mission, please join us downstairs after the service. Thank you.
you form a relationship, it's a special thing. It could be a lot of different things. Um, and the life for somebody, it could be going through a separation, divorce, that you get assigned to somebody. It could last as much as a couple of weeks to a couple of years. I and mean, it depends on the situation and the relationship and what's happening. But we are very grateful that Kathy went through this training um, with the help of Winona Church. We're very grateful she's already been commissioned with her, that church. And she received a lot of uh, goodie bags and stuff. Today we're borrowing her, her uh, pin. When we got commissioned, we had a small round pin. Uh, so some of you are here. And, and uh, this is quite a special thing. Have an eight more and everything. So, but the point is, we want to honor her because she does want to serve in our church. And, um, when the time is right, she will be able to do that. So, but, uh, if there's any other questions, certainly myself and any of those city ministers that are here would be glad to answer any questions. I like to tell people that Steve Ministry is the best pastoral care training available to lay people. It is uh, a means through which we can learn to support one another, walk with another, and be Christ in one another. And if you're going through somebody, uh, through something, uh, whether whether it's for a, a short time or, or maybe for a, a long time, uh, I, I encourage you to please reach out and uh, I can connect you with a Stephen minister who can walk with you, who can pray with you, who can meet Christ uh, for you and to you as you walk through that so you know in that you are never alone. Um, as we begin, I would uh, remind everyone that our callings come from Christ and they come through our baptism. And so let us join together in the litany printed in a bulletin. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the one hope of our calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Lord of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Kathy, the call of Christ is to willing, dedicated discipleship. Our discipleship is a manifestation of the new life that we enter through baptism. The grace bestowed upon you in baptism is sufficient for your calling, because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in faith and to commit our lives in ways that serve Christ. God has called you to this particular service. I invite you to commit yourself to Christ by answering these questions. Do you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Do you welcome the responsibility of this service because you are determined to follow the Lord Jesus, to love neighbors, and to work for the reconciling of the world? <clears throat> Friends, we remember that we are not called alone, but in community together. And so Kathy's calling is our calling. With that in mind, I would invite all of us present to proclaim our support to her by answering these questions. Do you, members of First Presbyterian Church in Pittman, confirm the call of God to our sister Kathy as a Stephen minister? Do you? Yes. Will you support and encourage her in this ministry? Yes. Let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claim us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Kathy to this time and place. Establish her in your truth and guide her by your Holy Spirit, that in your service she may grow in faith, hope, and love, to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Let us pray now together using the words in our bulletin. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ you call the disciples, and by the Holy Spirit, Make them one church to serve you. And let your spirit rule your church, so that we may be joined in love and service to Jesus Christ, who, having gone before us, is coming to meet us in the promise of your kingdom. Amen.
Remembering the gift of God's love, let us offer our gifts now to the Lord.
Lord, we lift up our nation to you. And especially we lift up the people of Chabad at Poway near San Diego who are reeling and mourning and trying to find ways to see your presence and your, your love. Lord, we mourn with our siblings in faith. And we ask that you would strengthen us and strengthen our bonds of friendship that we might join with them in building a better future and a better world. And we pray as well for all those who encourage and abet and aid those who do harm. And we ask that you would free them from harmful intentions, from anger, and from all of the chains of sinfulness and hurt that bind them and renew them Renew your spirit within them. Lord, we pray for all who are sick. We pray that you would bring pre your presence of healing, your presence of grace, your presence of comfort, but most of all, Lord, your presence, so that we might know that we are not alone, but even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us, and your rod and your staff are there to come. We remember also those who have died, and we ask that they might find peace and a place with you. O oh Lord, all of these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
to be kind, make haste to love, and may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the sustenance of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you this day, this week, and forever.